Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective. Part four of why the church is not mentioned past Revelations chapter four. Now, before we get into it, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comments section below. All comments are welcome. Continuing my reaction video to Maranatha Global Bible Studies uh, video on, and this is their question, why the church is not mentioned after Revelation 4. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to go to the video, but there's a couple of also scriptures I want to share because when we talk about eschatology, I think one of the problems I am observing with, let's say, Christendom abroad in their studies of eschatology is they tend to be focused, singularly focused, usually on one point of view. Now, as I kind of uh, say at the beginning, I hold to what's called the pre-tribulation rapture position. Uh, that is, I believe that the church would be raptured before the tribulation period begins. Now, our brother from our brothers from Global Maranatha Global Bible Study hold to a post-tribulation uh, position, meaning they believe that the church would be raptured. Well, actually, go through the tribulation. They believe the church will go through the tribulation and then be raptured at the end, or come to the end. So, um, so I, I, I'm refuting the argument that they make. Now, their standard arguments, uh, they make standard ar arguments, I should say. But what I don't, what I, where I see them failing is to inquire, look at all of scripture on the subject of eschatology. Now, also in particular, what does the Bible say about then the church? That This is what this specific video, which I have to say, I have to kind of commend them for this because I don't see people really tackling the, 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 the questions. Like I said, I would ask this question, right? They are asking the question. I, I just think they're giving the wrong answers. Now, partly because when we, when we talk about certain time periods, so let me go to <clears throat> let me bring up um let me bring up i wanted to show you one verse of scripture before i go to the video and uh so this is in acts chapter one and we've been here many times so uh, in verse chapter six, he says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? So that's a very important question. Why? If you go to the Old Testament scripture, this is all you find is prophecy concerning God restoring Israel. It's all over. It is part of the, in, the, the integral prophecies of the Old Testament. But now look at Jesus' reply. He said to them, it is not for you to know the time, the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. Now get, it's not for you to know that. Now what, notice what Jesus said though, that there are times and periods. Well, specifically, there's going to be a time when God will restore Israel. So now, when, when we tackle eschatology, we need to understand this time and then also mark it. What I think our brother is doing and those that believe in the post-tribulation or the mid, even mid-tribulation, they're not understanding the time and the periods here when Israel is going to be restored, but they kind of, kind of, mix everything together. So Jesus said to them, now this is the disciples, this is the apostles, his apostles who are asking them this. 
Are you restoring the kingdom of Israel? Get this, at this time. So, so now, the time that they're in, Jesus replied, it's not for you to know the times and periods that the Father is set by his own authority. So here's what they should know at this time, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. So the question here is, I'm going to ask two questions. What is God doing in this time? Right? In other words, the, it, he, he sent them out to be witnesses. So what is he doing? Then the other thing is, has this time ended? Right? Has this time ended? <clears throat> now, I know I said that I'm going to show you one more scripture before I get, get, get back to the video. Um, and Ephesians chapter... Ephesians chapter uh, 2, <coughs> excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, because I'm going to ask another question. Now remember he talks about the times, he talks about the time, they ask, are you restoring Israel at this time, right? He says, not for you to know the times and periods, so specifically, the time when God is going to restore Israel. It's not for you to know that. But this is what you should know. Be my witnesses in this time. So now here is the Apostle Paul. I want you to notice something. The Apostle Paul, verse 19. So then, now I ask the question, when they are, when they are sent out to be a witness, what is the effect of that? What happens when they are, when the church is out being the witness? Notice, because he stretches beyond. He's talking to the apostles. And by the way, their ministry was to the Jew. Paul makes that clear. Their ministry to the Jew. The apostle Paul ministry goes further into the Gentiles. Well, Jesus said that, right? In the last, that verse we said, he says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. So they already broke out Samaria. And then he says, to the ends of the earth, right? The ends of the earth. So this is, this is this period of time in which we are living in is to be a witness. But what is God doing in this time? So verse 19 says, so you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, but Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building being, so at this time, the whole building being put together by him grows into a holy sanctuary in the Lord. You also, now he's referring to the Gentiles, you also are being built together <clears throat> for God's dwelling place in the spirit. So God, right now, in this time period, is building a dwelling, a habitation, a holy sanctuary for his dwelling. So my question now is, has this building stopped? He says he's being, we're being built together. Has this building stopped? And do we know when this building will cease? With that, let's go to our brother and pick it up. Kind of where we left off, because a couple of things, again, I want to address and tackle in his argument. Okay, here we go. Virtues that they display, what, are the, what, what type <clears throat> of character do they have? Endurance, faithfulness. They have the name of Jesus. They're not ashamed of Jesus. They're willing to die for Jesus. The patient endurance of the saints. This is the call. This is the call of the Lord right now. If you're a pastor, the call on you is to prepare the church to live as faithful witnesses. 
to endure faithfully to the end, to be willing to lay down our lives. This is the cry and the call of the book of Revelation for us. Guys, be ready at any given time, whether you face the great tribulation and the Antichrist or simply an Antichrist in any tribulation as any one of us could at any time in history. I can walk out the door today and face an Antichrist. I could get a call right now and suddenly find myself in the midst of a personal tribulation. We're all Christians to be prepared for these things. But now let me address that because again, yeah, I agree with him. We should be taught that already. That's not what he's talking about though. He's talking about us being in the tribulation period during that time. But let me just kind of show you something here <clears throat> in Peter. This is first Peter chapter four, first Peter chapter four. So this is Peter writing to us. Verse four, verse one says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, equip yourself also with the same resolve because the one who has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desire, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the pagans choose to do, carrying on unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, lawless idolatry. So they are surprised that you do not plunge with them to the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was also preached uh, to those who are dead, so, so that although they might be judged by men in the fleshly realm, they might live by God in the realm, the spiritual realm. All right. Um, <clears throat> then, and I'm going to skip down to verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised when fiery ordeals come on come among you to test you if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice, you, you share in the sufferings of the Messiah, so that you may also rejoice with great joy at the revelation of his glory. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now, I would say this, that even though we live in America, we don't really suffer hard persecution. We are ridiculed for serving Christ. And I think even now we're seeing that that, that is ramping up in, in our very nation, that uh, Christianity is being attacked, insulted, demeanor. Uh, for example, what's called the ex Christian movement and deconstructing, that they're literally going after the very logic of Christianity, the logic of the Bible. In other words, you're stupid for believing in the Bible. You're, you're, you're not intelligent. So in that respect, yeah, we're, we're suffering. So he says right here, if you are ridiculed, verse 14 again, for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. None of you, however, should suffer the murderer or thief or an evildoer or the meddler. But if you don't want to suffer as a Christian, he should not be ashamed, but should glorify God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with a God's household. And as it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the, God, the gospel of God? Now, so here's the point I wanted to bring here. We're already taught as Christians that persecution is going to, is a part of our lives. Now in America, they said, I can, we, we're not gonna suffer hard persecution. Our constitution protects us. However, we certainly can be ridiculed for our faith. We can be ridiculed for the stands that we take. Um, and so in that respect, we do, we're, we're going to face some trials and tribulations and persecution for our faith, not just hard ones in America, but around the other places in the world, 
there are Christians who are suffering for their faith. Okay, they're, they're suffering for their faith. All right, so let me, let's go back. Could we together corporately face the final ultimate enemy, the demon? Could we face him? Yes. Are we prepared as a church? Again, many of the leading voices, the pastors, the leaders, the shepherds today are telling the church, don't worry about it. We're out of here anyway. Zoom, we're going to heaven. We'll never see it. Be at ease. So let's stop right here. That is the mischaracterization of holding to the pre-tribulation tribulation. I don't know any pastor that's teaching that. Be at ease because we're going to be out of here. Now, if he's lumping false teachers in, and there are false teachers, for example, that teach the prosperity gospels and faith and all that, but they're not teaching that from a standpoint of the tribulation or missing the tribulation. They're teaching that because it's just a false gospel that you could be rich. Um, the, the Word of Faith movement offers a false reality, a false hope in life. But, but, that's, but that's something different. That, that's not what he's talking about right here. I, I, I don't know anyone that teaches that, hey, you know, eat, drink, and be merry because we're going to escape the tribulation period. So therefore, you know, we could be at ease. As I said just now, we could suffer for, we shouldn't be surprised if we get persecuted, whether mentally or physically or both. Right now, Christians in America are being ridiculed for the mere belief in the Bible. That, that's persecution. Now, while it's not a beheading as you would encounter in a atheistic worldview, it's still persecution. But he's mischaracterizing that. No, no, no. We said that we're going to be raptured because Jesus said he was coming back for us. Now, the point is, is that there's no measure of who's going to suffer the greatest and then receive the greatest reward. In other words, there's no bragging rights because you say, I'm going to go through the tribulation period. Suppose he doesn't. And I said before, suppose the tribulation doesn't come for another 50 years. You know, will we be alive even at that time? And certainly there are Christians who have already went on to be with the Lord, right? Dating back 2,000 years. Do they now not have the same kind of glory if you were to suffer in under the beast? It, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. The point is, is that we carry out our purpose as in Acts 1 to be a witness to the ends of the earth. That's what we're doing here at the church. While we are being a witness, God, we are being built together for a habitation of God. That's what's going on. So the, the measure of our Christianity is not based upon how much we suffer. By the way, as I said before, I mentioned before, there was there was this uh, what's, what's called the martyr's crown. And a lot of people back even during the Apostle Paul's day and doing following uh, the, the early church age, going into the church father's age, that there were people that really, you know, kind of prided themselves on suffering, the amount of suffering they have. And in some cases, some really would throw themselves in the harm's way to be martyred. Point is, we don't have to do that. If it comes, it's going to come anyway, okay? All right. You know, like, have peace. You will never see these things. And the pre-tribulational teaching robs the church of the most essential cry, the most essential mandate the most essential exhortation of the book of Revelation, which is to be prepared to lay down our lives, not just individually, but together, corporately. Well, we're supposed to do that anyway. Whether we are in the book of Revelations, the tribulation period, that's a mandate that's already given to the church. There are millions of Christians 
who have already laid their lives down for the faith as we speak. So to place it just on the on the on the on the perspective of the book of Revelations is a mischaracterization of scripture. By the way, it's also a mischaracterization of of um of the church. Let me just say this as a pre tribber if I'm wrong and going and I and because there's another thing there where people uh, kind of get this characterization that because we hold to this truth, if I find myself in the tribulation period, oh my God, I'm going to be mad at God. Nonsense, especially since right now, if I'm going to get mad at God because of suffering, because there are Christians who get mad at God because of their suffering, to get mad at God because their life doesn't turn out the way they thought it should turn out. A loved one dies, you know, um, they get sick and they go, okay, I I'm mad at God. But that's a whole different story. And nothing to do with the tribulation period is what I'm saying. It has to do with, again, their character, whether they're in the tribulation period or not. All right. For a world that hates us. That's what we're called to do. The pre-tribulational rapture robs the church of this essential exhortation and call. It, it, again, from a pastoral perspective, these things very much matter. They're in the Bible for a reason. It's not just trivia. Oh, well, that's something that other people will experience. If those poor suckers get saved after this particular date, then they have to face the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan. They have to lay their lives down. But praise God, we don't have to. Like you talk about false privilege. Talk about giving the church a false sense of comfort. This well, hold on. Let me, let's, 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 a couple of things I want to do. Okay, he said the false sense of comfort. Well, let's go to First Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to start reading it, verse 13. Verse 13, First Thessalonians chapter 4. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by a revelation from the Lord. Now, if you go back to the last uh, um, uh, video, we talked about Paul's revelation, the mystery. Okay, watch this. We, um, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. Now, at this point, what is this coming? I'm going to, uh, uh, let me just, I'm going to cite First Corinthians, I mean, uh, John 14, when Jesus says, uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. I go and prepare a place for you. That is my father's house and many dwelling places. I go and prepare a place for you. Then he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself. So this prophecy is a fulfillment of what Jesus said to his disciples the night he was betrayed, the Last Supper. So he says, uh, for when he was still alive at the Lord's coming, will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. Now remember he's talking about those in Christ who have fallen asleep, not just anyone that died, but those in Christ. So he said, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with an archangel's voice, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So notice the Lord himself. You know what? Let me do this. Because I want you to see this too. I didn't mean to go this way, but John chapter 14. It. Uh, let me read this to you. So he says here, let me let me show you this. I want you, your eyes to see this. Your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. Now stop. Remember Ephesians, Paul said that you are being built together for a dwelling place. 
a holy sanctuary for God's dwelling place. You are being built. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back. See, I will come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. So where I'm going, I want you to be there. So notice what Paul says here. Uh, verse 15 again, for since for the, we say this to you by the revelation from the Lord, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. Now, the reason why I'm making the difference in terms of the term, the, I mean, in terms of the, the phrase here, the Lord's coming, because people, again, would jump, mix this together and say this is the second coming. Notice, again, I keep telling you, we go over with descriptions. What is being described here? When Jesus comes back, in which we call the second coming, keep this in mind, in the second coming, every eye will see him. He will come on the clouds or certain descriptions about that event. He's not describing that here. So notice he says, for the Lord himself, right, will descend from heaven with a shout. Right? So, first of all, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly... Let me go back and read verse 15 again. For we say this to you by the revelation from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming... Right? So what coming is he referring to? If I go... In my, notice this. Um, believe in God, believe in me. Believe in me also in my Father's house and many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you, I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away to prepare, to prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Verse 15 again, for we say to you, say this to you by the revelation, by a revelation from the Lord, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with an archangel's voice, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Notice the Lord himself. He just, so remember, the last supper he told us, I'm going to come and receive you. Something very unique for his body. That's all, something very unique for his body. Verse 17, now verse 16 again, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, with the trump of God, and then dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Okay, so here's what I have to acknowledge as well. We don't know when this is going to happen. In other words, clear statement that he's coming back for us. What we don't know is that it's just going to happen before the tribulation, halfway through the tribulation, or in the middle of the tribulation. So my position as this is going to happen before the tribulation period, this verse doesn't clearly state it. So to be honest, I have to say that, okay. But I do believe it's going to happen before the tribulation period. But here's my point. Regardless of it is, notice this event describes something that is going on with Jesus and his body. And what he said in Ephesians chapter 2, you are being, being built together. So the question is, that's as, as when does the building stop? Well, this will certainly be when the building stops and then he comes back for his body. He comes back for God's dwelling place. He comes back for God's sons. The ones who cry out, Abba, Father. So my, here's my thing. So I, I say this. That's why there's no reason for us to be in, the, in, in, in the tribulation period. In other words, what is going on in the tribulation period, yeah, it's a thing that's going on in the tribulation period. My 
what I'm saying is that this is not what's being declared for God's sanctuary that he is building. Okay. So, so this, this idea is that when it says we're being cowards, we're, just, we're trying to <clears throat> run away. No. <clears throat> while we're why why while God this this process of you being built together we are suffering we are being hated by all men for his name's sake he does told us to arm ourselves for suffering for persecution Paul himself says those who live godly will suffer will suffer persecution if you live godly, you will suffer persecution. So that's what I'm saying. We're, we're, there's a lot of stuff that's being mixed together that should not be mixed together. Essentially, what the false prophets are rebuked for. Through, I mean, like you read Ezekiel 13, Jeremiah 14. You read the Lord's rebuke to the false prophets, to the false shepherds of Israel. You have said peace, peace, when there is no peace. <clears throat> now, I, I went I, I went to Jeremiah 31. Again, he's mixing some stuff right here, making an argument on false pretense. In Jeremiah 31, the false pre uh, the, the false prophets who were predicting peace was a a false prophecy in direct contradiction to God's true prophets who were prophesying judgment against God's people, Israel, for their sins. So that's, you know, again, this is a, a mischaracterization there. He's, he's misinterpreting scripture, misapplying scripture here. Because um, it, it, God was speaking directly to Israel, by the way, which came to pass, which came to pass. You've given a false sense of comfort. You haven't proclaimed a message which encourages repentance and the fear of the Lord. All right, I meant to say this. I didn't, um, let me go back. Look at verse 18, <laughs> because again, when he says, verse 17, then we who are still alive will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So I, we can encourage with the hope of the rapture. Okay, with the hope of the rapture. <clears throat> he actually says it down in chapter 5. Oh, where did that hear? Oh, um, look at, okay, well, you know what, let me, I, I, I'm going to read all of this so we can kind of get the, again, the gist. So remember, he says right here, and I'm going to, I'll go through this quickly. He says, uh, let me go, I'm going to stop back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this and I'm going to go back. I'm going to highlight us telling him to take care of it. But notice this, we, verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed brothers concerning those who are asleep. Now, the other thing is they were concerned about those who have died in the Lord so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by the revelation from the Lord, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a with an archangel's voice, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will, will rise first. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, about the times and the season. Brother, you do not need anything to be written to you, for you yourself very, know over every world that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night when they say peace and security, then certain destruction come upon them like labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So he's not talking about us. 
Now, remember, I'm going to make the comparison that he made about Jeremiah. Again, it was about judgment. And then if, if a false person says, in this circumstances, that there's going to be peace, yes, they're false prophets giving false hope. But verse 4, but you, brothers, are not in the dark for this day to overtake you like a thief. For you are the sons of the light and the sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then we must not sleep like the rest, but we must stay awake and be serious. For those that sleep, sleep at night. Those that get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, we must be serious. Put on the armor of faith and of love on our chest and put on the helmet of hope of a salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Now, I'm going to come back for a moment because I want to make a point. There are those who try to make this wrath and kind of parse wrath. And they, in a sense, what they try to say is that the wrath is at the end, not during the seven-year tribulation period. But more on that at another time. But notice what he says right here. Verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. So whether we are wake or sleep, so that's that's this point here. Whether we wake or sleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you're already doing. So my point is, look at the thought again that Paul is making as opposed to what he's making. In other words, not one of, Hey, you better gear up to go through the great tribulation period. Because, by the way, do you know what the great tribulation period entails? In other words, if you read Revelation chapter 6, what is going on? Now, so the question would be, why do we need to be there? In other words, it, you know, that's like now, we, we there's enough tribulation for us going on here. But why do we need to be doing that period of time? No, it's don't worry about it. We're out of here anyway. Everything's going to be okay. That is the essence of a false prophet. Forgive me, I'm, I'm preaching. The fifth problem with the pre-tribulational interpretation is that they are unable to explain the purpose and the reason for the, the, the uh, tribulation saints. Okay, so there's, it's always about, they go, no, you have to understand the final seven years, that's for Israel, it's not for us, so therefore the Lord must remove us. And I go, well, then why are all these tribulation saints there? What's their purpose? Well, they're just there, just incidentally, because they get saved afterwards. I go, well, what's their purpose? So let's answer that question. First of all, he makes the false assumption that saints always refer to Christians, which is a false assumption. In other words, his assumption is, he says, well, what is the purpose of the saints? So now he's going to say that the word saints in there must mean Christians or slash the church or slash the body of Christ. Therefore, the body of Christ is present doing the church. So let's take a quick look at something here. Um, by the way, um, I, it is interesting. I was going to read this here uh, in the book of Revelations. Um, the book itself is kind of, the letter is written to the seven, the Revelation is written to seven churches. Now, that's why we see kind of at the end, but. What I, I what this this letter, these letters here are Jesus' letters to churches, so seven churches around the Asia Minor area. One of those churches, uh, Paul started, for example, Ephesus. Okay, we know Paul started Ephesus. Laodicea was a church that Paul was associated with. And one of the letters he sent, you can read this in the book of Colossians. 
So, but she said, when y'all read the letter of Colossians, send it to Laodicea. And then he said, also read the, the letter from Laodicea. So there's a, somewhere out there, just, but there's a church, there's a letter that Paul writ, writ, wrote to the church of Laodicea. Now, what is interesting about this here, when he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to read through these two chapters because I want you to, again, get the gist of it because I'll, and then I'll come back. I'm going to read through them. Watch this. He says, write to the angel of the church of Ephesus. No, I'll tell you, I'm not because it, it's, it's, it's really long. I'm not, I'm not going to read it. Here's what I'm, I'm going to make this statement here and then, then say, exhort you to read through it. But the word saint does not appear in chapters 2 and 3. Now, that's interesting. The word saint does not appear in these two chapters, but the word church does. Okay? So he asked the question, what, what is the purpose of saint? Well, first of all, the word saint, what does it mean? The word saint means called out ones, separated ones. So the question is that if saints refer only to Christians, now granted, what is interesting, that in Paul, Paul uses the term saint throughout his letters. So in the New Testament letters, we see saints repeatedly used over and over and over. When we get to here, the chapters two and three, the word saint doesn't appear, but the word church appears repeatedly in these two chapters. Now, the point is that the word saint doesn't exclusively mean body of Christ or church or Christian. The reason why is because, again, you can go back to the word saint, our English word for saint. We can go back in the Old Testament and we see the word saint used repeatedly a lot in the book of Psalms. Okay. So then when we come to now the book of Revelations, after chapters 2 and chapters 3, where it talks specifically about the church, then we see the word saints used repeatedly from chapters 5 on. So now to ask this question in, what is the purpose of the word saint? Well, the word saint, as it's used here, in contrast to the ungodly world, those who are called out, those the separated ones. But then who are they? Well, you can go and look at each group and you can decipher what it is. So, for example, uh, in chapter, uh, let's see here. Where, okay. Uh, chapter 7, I believe I want. Now, here's the interesting thing here. Now, in chapter 7, since I'm here, uh, uh, I want you to notice in verse 4, this is chapter 7, it says, And I heard the number of those that were sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of Israel. And then it goes on and lists 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. So are these saints, and are these saints different than the saints that are mentioned when he says here, after this, verse 9, the, uh, there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne, before the Lamb. They were, uh, they wore, uh, they were robed in white and palm branches in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice. Um, I'm going to skip down to verse 13. Then one of the elders asked me, "Who are these people robed in white, and where did they come from?" I said. To him, sir, you know that he told me these are the ones coming out of great tribulations. And they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, uh, for this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his sanctuary. Then, okay, watch this. They serve him day and night in his sanctuary. Watch this. The one seated on the throne was shelter them. They were no longer hunger. They were no longer thirst. They were the sun would no longer strike on them. Uh, no any heat for the Lamb, who in the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, I want again, I pay attention to details. Look at who are these group of people? 
Are they the sons of God crying, Abba, Father? Are they the body of Christ? So let's ask the question, are they the body of Christ? Are these groups the body of Christ? And if you look at the description of them, you don't find the same description as to those who are the body of Christ. Remember, there are times and periods that God is working with. And again, let me be clear, that is not, I'm not espousing dispensationalism. Okay, I'm, I'm not. Uh, the, the, uh, however, let's also pay attention to what Jesus said. They asked, are you, remember that when, they, when Peter and them asked, are you restoring the uh, kingdom of Israel at this time? He says, not for you to know the times and periods that the Father put it into uh, his authority, which means there are times and periods. So what is God doing? Can we distinguish the times and the periods? Okay, let's go ahead. Well, they're going to be faithful witnesses. I go, so then we could be there as faithful witnesses as well. No, because it's not for us, because we're, we're already under the blood. And I go, but they're under the blood. Why doesn't the Lord just rapture them as soon as they get saved? Well, because they get saved, you know, like it's this circular logic that simply doesn't. So again, it, 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 well, I, I think he's making a circular argument. And I think he's making a straw man argument because he's not paying attention to, for example, the group of people that we read. By the way, look, so this group here, uh, so do you notice here he says, after this, I looked and there was a multitude from every nation, tribe, people, language, with no one can number, standing before the throne. This is where he sees these people. They're standing before the throne. Now, this is chapter 7. There are other groups of people to follow that's going to come out that they're going to that that John is going to identify, right? This is just one group, and they're already in heaven. So when he says, "Why don't they just rapture them out?" That's a false dichotomy. There, they're being martyred during this period of time. They're being beheaded. They're, 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 they're literally dying because they're going to refuse to take the mark. So guess what? They're already in heaven. We see another group where he looks up and they're the souls of those who were what? Martyred. Makes sense. I'm going to play a little quote here from Amir Tsafardi, again, very well-known pre-tribulational Bible teacher where he kind of articulates uh, this particular problem. Then why, why is the rapture? Why, why can't Jesus just come back and that's it? Well, God loves you so much that he wants you to be taken away before he is going to pour his judgment over this world. That's why. Okay, so you'll often hear this type of sentiment expressed by pre-tribbers or by pre-trib teachers. So again, here's a leading pre-tribulational teacher. He says, why does the Lord remove the church from the earth? So let me just say this, and I'm going to let him speak, but I don't care what, what this other pastor says right here. And, and that pastor, in a sense, doesn't whether his opinion is right or wrong doesn't change what scripture says. So this is just meant to build his argument up so that he can kind of tear down the pre-tribulational view. That, that's all it is. Uh, his, his quoting doesn't mean anything. And that doesn't mean that every pre-tribulation teacher gets it right either. I'm not going to tell you I get it right all the time. But what does the Bible say? What, what does the scripture actually teach? Because God loves you so much. He loves you so much that he wants to remove you. And I go, okay, if we follow this logic, if we accept what Amir says, then we have to then say, God doesn't love the tribulation saints. Yes, Jesus died for them, but he doesn't love them. He loves us enough to remove us. But they, on the other hand, they got saved again after a particular date. So therefore, his love doesn't extend to them. He's going to let... That's a conclusion that he draws. That's not even what the man said. That is the conclusion... And I'm going to say a straw man conclusion that he put in there. The man didn't say that. The man didn't say God didn't love them because God didn't remove them. 
let, let's just follow the logic here. If the rapture happens and then the tri seven uh, the seven year tribulation period happened, yes, people get saved because th th just follow the logic because the church is not there. Now at the same time, guess what? The church being there doesn't then exclude people who will get saved during the tribulation period. In other words, so whether the church is present in the seven year tribulation period or not, people are still gonna get saved. People are gonna get saved. So let's say the, 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 the rapture happened, the, the seven year tribulation period starts, people are still gonna get saved. People that God is still dealing with who he's calling his uh, people. He just, we just read, by the way, where he, he's gonna seal 144,000 Jews from every tribe of Israel, right? That in itself is something because so is the church involved in that? Does the church need to be there for that to happen? And be mown down to be conquered by the Antichrist. I, I don't believe that. These are shining examples. They're living as we should live, as faithful witnesses of Jesus. I think Jesus loves them very much. So you can't tell me the reason we're raptured is because he loves us. That's simply. Sure can. That's, you, you can say that, but one, ha one doesn't have to do with the other. And again, two things can be true at the same time. He can love us. He can remove us. But guess what? There are going to be people that's going to go through the tribulation period that will be beheaded by the beast. Just like, they're, just like no one said that because Christians died in the uh, second and third century, they were martyred. No one is even bringing the issue of, well, because they're martyred, let's question God's love. False dichotomy. It works. Second, you have to say, what about Israel? I know that most of Israel isn't saved during the tribulation, that they ultimately get saved when Jesus returns, when they look upon the one they have pierced. But does he not love them? If he removed us because he loves us, you have to say God doesn't love Israel. And this is coming, by the way. Amir Tzafardi is a Messianic Jew who lives in Israel. And he's articulating an argument that logically infers that God doesn't love Israel. Now no, it's one you, you raised. It's not one anyone, the Bible didn't say, another one I didn't say. You say that, okay? You say that, okay? And I said, <coughs> I just read, God sealed 144,000 male virgin Jews during this period. And you go, but they're not believers, so he doesn't love them until they become believers. But he knows that those that survive until his coming. He knows that all Israel will be saved, as Paul the Apostle says in Romans 11. All those who survive, all those who remain at the coming of the Lord, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So you can say, well, they're not believers yet, but they will be, and he knows that. God loves Israel. He loves the church. He loves the tribulation saints. He loves all of us, and yet he will allow us to be conquered. He'll allow us to be broken in order that we can imitate Jesus, the one who conquered this world. Behold, I have overcome the world, he said. He says, be encouraged, fear not. In this age, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take courage, I've overcome the world. He overcame the world. How did he overcome it? By being overcome. He overcame the world by laying down his life, and then the Lord raised him back up, right? And we likewise, as his students, as his disciples, as imitators of Jesus, he is our model. We are called to imitate him. We all. Let me just pick split hairs as well. We're more than that. See, that's why I showed you those scriptures. We are sons of God. We have the spirit of God crying in our hearts, Abba, Father. You, our brother included, right, are being built together as a dwelling place for God. We are no longer strangers, but we're fellow citizens and members of God's household. So uh, I take issue with how careful he is to choose his words. Give us the whole scope. We're called to lay down our lives and to be conquered. 
in order that we, like our master, will also overcome this world. It's through being overcome that we overcome. Look at it. Look at the parallel. Throughout the, the paradox, throughout Revelation, the ones who are overcome, he calls them overcomers. The ones who are killed, the, one who, the ones who lose their life, the one that, that Satan is given permission to conquer, they're called overcomers. Guys, the calling on the church. Well, let's just kind of refute what he is saying here. Um, let me go to 1 John chapter, 1 John chapter 5. See, again, when you try to go out of your way to, to, to make a case, one of the problems, read all of Scripture, all of Scripture. So he says we overcome. Why? By being martyred. Okay, watch this here, which is why his, again, perspective is wrong. But look at this. So he says, verse 1, this is First John chapter 5, verse 1, says everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. This is how we know that we love God's children. We love God and obey his commands. Uh, for this is what love for this is what love for God is to keep his commandments. Now his commandments not burden. Now get this. Whatever has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. So not this. So and who is he who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So yeah, I'm splitting hairs with our brother here because so yes the group that Jesus is talking to in Revelations, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame by the testimony. They overcame by their laying down of the life. How do we overcome our faith? And if we have faith, we're born of God. We're children of God. We're that building being built. Today is for you and me to be overcomers. We overcome not by being removed prematurely and avoiding tribulation. We overcome by trusting His Spirit to empower us to live as Jesus lived in the midst of trials and tribulations in the time of great testing. So, again, I'm going to end it right here. I trust that um, some All of right. these significant problems. All right, I can, I'll end it here, but again, Let's go what he says. Uh, everyone who believes in the Messiah has been born of God. Verse 4, whatever the born of God conquers the world. So the problem here is for us as the believer, remember, because it's not measured by the kind of acts. Now, let, again, let me. what I'm not disputing, it's the fact of as Christians that we faith persecution. If you run from persecution, there's a character, the Christian character flaw in you. But that's not how we're saved. That's not the work, that's not the, the effect that Jesus had on us as we've seen. So again, I again, that's why I do these videos. That, let's look at all of scripture, not just cherry pick the ones that fit a narrative. See, and, and again, I'll, I'll concede that um, since, you know, I don't have a plain scripture tells me that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation period, fine. If I find myself in the tribulation period, faith in the Antichrist, it's no different than if I was to face Nero 2,000 years ago, that Paul faced, that Peter faced, that Christians were burned at the stake, that Christians died in the Roman arenas. No different. But 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 that understand, but that's not why I overcome either. I overcome because Jesus overcame. His act caused us to overcome. 
Alright guys, that's it for me. Don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to VP the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments. So welcome. Till next time I'll see you then.